Controversial billboards, shocking roadside placards, and intense online campaigns. Tactics taken up by some activists recently on a range of issues may have succeeded in getting the attention of Canadians, but not always for the right reasons. Often road tested in the U.S. first, how well do these aggressive methods of advocacy fit into the Canadian context? Joining us now on that, in Vancouver, British Columbia via Skype, Rod Giltaka. He's executive director of the Canadian Coalition for Firearm Rights. And in the nation's capital, Camille Labchuk, executive director of the animal rights group, Animal Justice. And back here in our studio, Steve Staples, president of the consulting group Public Response and founder of the Rideau Institute. Joshua Zanin, account director at the communications and marketing agency Proof, formerly an advisor to various ministers in Stephen Harper's government. And political anthropologist Antonio Sorge, a lecturer at York University's Department of Anthropology. And we are delighted to welcome all three of you to our studio here. Steve, I haven't seen you in a long time. You were uh, on this program many years ago. Nice to be back. Uh, Camille, good to see you again. You've been here a lot lately. Uh, I have. We, we, nice to see you. We will discuss reasons for that as we go along. And Rod, thanks for being there for us on the left coast. We are just going to, we're going to start, this is a clip we're going to start with just to get us into the swing of things here. This is Rod's organization, the Canadian Coalition for Firearm Rights. This is something that his group has put out. We'll play that clip and then we'll come back and chat. Sheldon, if you would. Despite literally thousands of tweets in opposition, the majority offering evidence that these doctors truly didn't understand the issue, and many of them inviting dialogue, actual invitations from the firearms community to work with the doctors. But there were no responses from Dr. Ahmed and her team, except to label all opposition as affiliated with the National Rifle Association in the United States, specifically to discredit and insult those who disagreed with them. Many doctors would soon block all opposing opinions, but not before issuing the ultimate pejorative. That the only reason that hundreds of people were disagreeing with the group and its leader was because they were racists and misogynists. Okay, Rod, I'm going to get you to sit tight for a second and we're going to get everybody else to weigh in and then uh, I'll let you have the last word on what everybody else thinks about this. You want to start us off? What's your view of that? Uh, it certainly doesn't pull any punches, I would say. Um, it's... Uh, it's, I find this kind of thing a bit of a delicate balance. It's important uh, when you're an advocacy organization trying to achieve a public policy objective that you're correcting the record or something is, is, in, is not, a, not a fact. Uh, but it's, it's a fine line in terms of finding the right tactic where you're actually not alienating people and you're bringing people into the tent. Do you think that snippet alienates as opposed to corrects? I think for this issue, it, it probably does not alienate people. This is such a divisive issue that it's probably uh, appealing to the exact type of supporters that they're looking to have in their camp. Steve, what's your view? I find it alarming, Steve. I think it, um, it's, it's, it's signaling to um, his base. It's not really trying to argue on the merits of the issue. It seems to be targeting the individuals that are advocating for gun control or their professions. And I think it really takes the debate, uh, the level of debate in a place where I find, I find really alarming. Antonio. I think, generally speaking, it's symptomatic of a polarization of public debate on many issues, not simply gun control, but animal rights as well, certainly, and likely an outgrowth of broader the rise of uh, populist sentiment over the last decade. We're actually going to show a clip about uh, an on the animal rights issue in a second and get Camille to comment on that. But before she comments on that, uh, I want to give her a chance to comment on this. Camille, your view of that clip. Well, I found it alarming, too, and I think when we look at advocacy strategies, there's a difference between ones that are out there designed to promote truth, designed to inspire people to take action, and then what we just heard, which in my view is designed more to, to shut down conversations. It's trying to delegitimize the voices of doctors, of the frontline workers on the issue of gun violence, and make them not part of the conversation. And I think that shutting down the speech is problematic. Ron, I'll give you the last word on this. Well, I think it's interesting that people would perceive us as shutting down the speech. It was the doctors that were blocking us and the doctors that were using slurs against us. And unfortunately, our group, we have to take steps to make sure that the public knows the level of this discourse. We've gone to them with, with calm, rational, uh, offers of calm, rational conversation and debate, and this is what they've come back to us at. So it, I think it almost is indicative of how you will believe doctors, even though you see their bad behavior over regular law-abiding Canadians when it comes to gun control, and that's a concern for us. Steve, th this, uh, I think many people would suggest that these kinds of 
uh, social media campaigns are a departure by Canadian standards from the past. Do you see it that way? Oh, yeah, you bet. Um, I, I, they, uh, the Internet itself is a wonderful tool. It's been great for many organizations to reach out to Canadians to find new supporters and, and even to raise money. But, you know, as that Canadian Marshal McLuhan said, the medium's the message. It's a very hot medium. It appeals to emotion, uh, to pushing buttons. And that can lead some groups, and I would say this one is, is, is crossing that line in many ways, at, at uh, using an emotional appeal that can be dangerous. It can get out of control and can result in unintended consequences maybe, but I, th I think it's really alarming and symptomatic of the lowering of the level of debate in this country. Well, Antonio, if, if you run a group that's a legal group that uh, represents a group of people that has a legal product that you're allowed to own if you pass the background checks and so on and so forth, and you feel you're being maligned, isn't this consistent with the response to that? I would say very much it is. Um, to my regard, it's... Um, it's a perspective on, on a contemporary debate that uh, doesn't want to um, attenuate any messages and does not pull any punches. Um, very much we're speaking to, to a base um, who uh, would accept the, the, the strong message put forth by uh, CCFA and um, in doing so would probably solidify the um, um, a group of political actors who may um, who may suit their um, their okay. broader agenda. Well, let me put that to Rod. Rod. You know, Rod, the suggestion is that this is that the intensity of the message that you just put out there is designed to mm. sort of rally your supporters, as opposed to change the minds of those who may be persuadable on this issue. Can you speak to that? Well, the intensity of the message is a direct result of the intensity of the slander that's been levied against regular gun owners as an organization. We're actually a, a, an educational organization, a public relations organization. And, and as this doctor's group had come out of the woodwork, um, their message is, has brought this to a new low. And we've actually done nothing but extend our hand. And we continue to do that, to say, hey, let's, let's meet and let's work on this problem together because gun owners want a safer Canada too. Um, and personally, I've learned a lot about this. I've learned a lot about doctors and the doctors in this specific group through this experience because I would al always have thought, you know, here's a, here's a very highly educated, highly respected group of people in Canada. And if anyone would want to sit down and have a civilized, mature, honest debate about these things with the goal of, of coming up with solutions, it would be them. And I couldn't have been more wrong. So we almost kind of got dragged into this, but I, I just can't allow gun owners to be slandered and not answer back. And unfortunately in Canada, the mainstream media has not been available, uh, made available to us to tell the other side of the story. They've picked their winners and losers long before they made a single uh, phone call for interviewees, so. Right. Oh, Stephen is uh, taking issue with you here. Go he's ahead. On, he's on the media now, so you can't really complain that you're not getting any media attention when, when, when you're here now. And, and I don't see any slander. In fact, I watched the interview with Dr. Ahmed. I thought she took a real high ground. Here's a person who is a doctor at St. Michael's. She's seeing the evidence of gun trauma every day in her work. She's a frontline worker. She's trying to treat these people. It's only a natural extension that someone like that would not just say, where is this gun violence coming from, but why? And start asking those questions. Why do we see so many uh, gun injuries and shouldn't we try to change the, uh, the policy? Rather, his organization, you know, he kind of went after her job, started sending letters in to the college. I mean, that sort of attacks a person on a very personal level, starts to go after the messenger, and because it just seems like a desperate measure because they can't win on the strength of their arguments, as he's saying, and trying to go after the person individually. Rod, you want to come Steven, back on that? St yeah, Stephen, did we call anyone a racist or a misogynist? I didn't hear or her. Or was it the call. doctors? I didn't hear her say that at all, and well, I think it's a legitimate saw, question. You just, saw, you just saw a clip where they're, t they're tweeting that stuff out on Twitter. I, you just saw it. That's yeah, why I made the video. I don't know. I, uh, Ron, I also watched another one of your videos on your show. You, you, you were telling your supporters that they should be concerned that the emergency response police are going to bust in their door, throw hand grenades and, and blind and deafen and maybe shoot their children. I mean, that's on another clip on your website. That is really alarming and is, and is uh, much more uh, extreme than this video. And I'm just, you know, where, where, where do you expect that to go? How do you expect viewers to respond to that? I mean, it's really worrisome. Josh, you want in here? Yeah, I'm, to 
pull the lens back for a moment. I, we're, we're in an age now where we can use social media tools to collapse the distance between your average citizen and a decision maker who's going to make a change on policy. And organizations that are trying to achieve objectives have that much, they have that much uh, greater ability to connect those people directly and to motivate them and to move them towards supporting their cause. Uh, but at the same time, because we're looking at issues that are so visceral, um, it's so easy to just end up talking past one another. And it seems to me that's really what I'm observing, at least in this case. Is the, the, it's less even a discussion about some of the merits of the debate and more about what the de more about the tactics of the debate. Hmm. Okay, let's get Camille back in here at this point because, Camille, you're obviously, as your organization's name suggests, working towards a more just world for animals and better treatment for animals. And we want to show, um, we're going to show 30 seconds here. And I guess if you're listening on podcast, you don't have to worry about this. If you're watching on television or on your computer and you can see the images here, we're just going to give you the heads up. Uh, these are disturbing images and you may want to, I don't know, use your judgment about whether or not you, you want to watch these or your kids ought to watch them uh, over the next 30 seconds. Sheldon, roll it if you would. Okay, Camille, can you tell us, first of all, where those pictures were taken? Yes, yeah, Steve, you're right. They're very difficult to watch. And uh, those images were taken at Chilliwack Cattle Sales, which is one of the largest factory dairy farms in Canada. It's in British Columbia. And they were taken by uh, an employee of Chilliwack Cattle Sales who wore an undercover camera and simply filmed what he saw and the conditions that the cows were experiencing. Did your organization work with that employee who was inside to ensure that the pictures were taken and the word would get out? This was done by Mercy for Animals, which I was a board member of at the time. That was predating my days with animal justice. But um, that's right. The, the point of the employee taking those images was to evaluate whether anything untoward was happening on Canadian farms. And unfortunately, every time one of these undercover investigations does occur, um, that's exactly what we see is really shocking abuse, like this cow being hung by the neck with a chain, uh, beaten with canes, kicked. Disturbing images like that are often the result. And when those images get out, what's the impact? Well, this particular undercover investigation, I have to say, uh, has probably had the largest reaching impact of any of them that have ever, ever been done in Canada. So it resulted in many, many charges being laid against uh, seven individual employees, as well as the company and its directors. Those resulted in um, several guilty pleas and several additional convictions, hundreds of thousands of dollars of fine, even jail time for some of the workers, which was unprecedented in Canada. And it also resulted in legal change. So the B.C. government took steps to enact additional protections for dairy cows into legislation. So I would say that the impact was definitely vast. And fair to say you were satisfied with the impact that that video had. I think that video exposes things to people in a way that simply explaining to them or even presenting images to them can't. So it's one thing for me to show up to a legislative committee and describe abuse that we believe occurs on dairy farms and the conditions that animals endure. It's quite another thing to show a video. It definitely resonates more with people when they can see for themselves what's happening. And one last thing, Camille, do you know whether the person who shot that video got a job at that f facility for the sole purpose of essentially taking those pictures to get the word out. Undercover investigators go into facilities like that uh, with the intention of seeing what occurs. There is no sort of predetermined desire to see anything, but what inevitably does happen is that they witness things that are quite disturbing to your average person, uh, frequently illegal things, and certainly animal abuse. And so when that does occur, they expose that. Steve, any issues here about um, the tactics used here to get the word out? Well, it's, it's strong, it's powerful. We've seen the impact that these kinds of images can have. And, um, uh, and I know that this, I've, I think I've heard about this one and it did bring in some legislative changes or at least some action politically. So in effect, it, it was quite effective. I think though, it's very different than some of the other videos that we're talking about. This isn't targeting an individual. It's not going after somebody's job. It's not saying that they're a bad person. It's exposing something that almost nobody ever sees and educates people to, to take action. So I think that's quite legitimate and, and very different 
than some of the other things that you see on social media where they attack people as individuals and really kind of uh, lower the debate. So, how, In your activist past, how far have you gone to get the word out about something that disturbed you? Well, you know, that's something you always have to take into consideration because uh, whether you need media attention or whether you're trying to move an issue forward, uh, I've used a full range of uh, debates in Parliament. I've been involved in where people have occupied MPs' offices. 1.20 years ago, we even showed up at a liberal fundraiser barbecue with signs out front in a residential neighborhood uh, to try to get our message out. Now, we didn't trample anyone's lawn or anything like that, but it did feel a little strange, Steve, I'll admit it. And it was a tactic that we, we never did again because we were afraid that we were kind of crossing a threshold there beyond what we wanted to do. And um, I haven't done it again, and, and I've won many campaigns just on the strength of arguments alone, and I'm going to stick to that as much as I can. There has been a tradition in Canada that you can protest like hell at a politician's office, but you, d you usually don't go to their front lawn. So you went to their front lawn, and you, and you haven't done it again since. It, it was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was fine, but even as activists, we kind of felt, okay, um, Maybe this is not where we want to be, but we made our point and left. Got and it. Never did it again. Josh, where's, I don't know if anybody can actually answer this question, but, but where's the line that ought not to be crossed when it comes to, on the one hand, wanting to get the word out about something that you find very disturbing versus you've crossed a line, ethically speaking, and you shouldn't have gone that far? Uh, I think it's part of what Steve just touched on, which is the personal, and the other piece is the facts. You have to be, you have to be uh, arguing with an actual set of facts. And I'll use a parallel example to the video we just watched. Um, when I was uh, an advisor to the Minister of Fisheries and Oceans over a decade ago, and the seal hunt was a major public policy issue that was very much being debated, uh, there were uh, advocacy organizations that were regularly showing clips of white coat seal pups being killed mm -hmm. um, as a way to motivate their supporters to oppose the hunt. That's been illegal for almost as long as I've been alive. So it's, it's an example of uh, the need for us all to apply a lot of due diligence about all the information that we're taking in to ensure, and then we're, to ensure that we're keeping the organizations accountable and the, the, the uh, elements are being argued on the, on the merits of the facts and not, not being distorted. You worked for the Stephen Harper government. I did. My recollection of that government is that there were the occasional protest against that government, against various policies. I can think of a handful. You, <laughs> you can think of a handful. In your view, um, how many of those protests that you would have seen in your time working for that government would have crossed the line, ethically speaking? Um, I can think of one example where I felt things went a little bit too far. And again, it actually brings back to, to the seal hunt. And I can think of one where I thought it was very, uh, where I was actually very impressed with the way it was approached. The, the one where I was less impressed was, to Steve's point about uh, protesting MPs' offices, I have no problem with that. When, when I was a spokesperson to the fisheries minister, I'd, I'd receive, I mean, my name would be going out in press releases by advocacy organizations as a potential target for people to send correspondence or argue, uh, argue their case. I thought that was perfectly above board. I was a political person working directly for a politician, that I'm a legitimate target in that kind of an instance. But I remember the, uh, the public servants who were manning our, our phones in the minister's office, working seven to two every day uh, on a rotating basis, part-time folks uh, being inundated with abusive phone calls. And not just from, not from international organizations, but from people, from people right here in Canada who were lambasting them. And they have no role, role to play in the public policy process. So you thought that crossed the line? I thought that crossed the line. Got it. Yeah. And Tony, can you help us on where you think that line ought to be? Well, I make the general observation that the problem with strident messaging is that it tends to present uh, a monolithic reality. Um, the video uh, by Animal Justice certainly does depict uh, animal abuse in dairy farms as a normative reality that's to be found. If not everywhere, at least it's ubiquitous. Um, whereas uh, messaging by CSEFR tends to present gun control as being um, fundamentally about the abrogation of gun owners' rights. And uh, they'll start with a few regulations, and then before you know it, they'll take our guns away and they'll enslave us. Um, we can't take these messages quite far, and in doing so, we don't give much credit to our political opponents. Well, since you brought that issue up, shall we show one more clip here? <clears throat> this is uh, the gun control battle with the doctors, which we saw a clip of earlier. We'll show one more. This, again, is from uh, Rod's organization, and then we'll come back and chat. Sheldon, if you would. Now you've got Joe and Jane Canadian sitting there watching The Bachelor or whatever, and you've got their two kids, their two teenagers there, 
and all of a sudden, boom, the door go, comes off its hinges, a distraction device is rolled in there, boom, everybody's blind, and all these guys, 15 guys, come pouring into the house, and they point guns in the faces of everyone in there, including the kids. Okay, why do they have to do that? Because it's a gun call, man. They don't know what's happening. They're thinking, they don't want to get shot either. So they have no idea, okay? And I don't blame them for it. Okay, they're gonna go in there, guns drawn, pointing the guns in all these people's faces. And maybe one of the kids has a cell phone. Maybe one of the kids has a remote control. And maybe they get shot right through the neck and killed by ERT. And that stuff happens sometimes. Rod, that, uh, what you've just described is obviously a horrifying scenario, but uh, the question is, does that actually happen? Well, yeah, and it is a horrifying scenario, hence the reason why I made that message. And it was directly for the doctors because the doctors aren't talking specifically about gunshot wounds and the toll that these, these deaths and wounds take on our society. Of course they're qualified for that, but they are, they're going a step further and they're saying, we wanna ban all guns, we wanna ban handguns, we wanna, they're, they're advising on policing policy and legislation and that's where the issue is. So this is actually a very interesting situation. I think your panel's gonna, going to be interested in it. So if, while I answer this, keep in mind that Dr. Ahmed, even when she was on, is comparing advocating for gun bans to advocating invo advocacy involving seatbelts and cigarettes. So my understanding is she's astonished and maybe even outraged at basically three suggestions. One, that possibly 5% of lifelong law-abiding gun owners would be in non-compliance with a total ban on, on guns. Well, is that true? Well, look at Quebec. They are simply just asking people to register guns. They have a 75% non-compliance rate. Number two, they're outraged that should someone be in unauthorized possession, the idea that if somebody's in unauthorized possession of a prohibited firearm, that, they, uh, that the police would not send a general duty member there. I mean, I don't think Stephen works for police. I've worked with police for a decade. They, when someone is refusing to surrender a firearm that they have improperly, they don't send general duty, they send ERT. And then third, I said there, the possibility exists for an accidental shooting by ERT because ERT is not a scalpel, it's a sledgehammer. And these are law-abiding people and, and law-abiding people don't understand, they don't, haven't had any previous interactions with law enforcement, so they can do the wrong things. Do okay. police shoot the but, wrong people sometimes? But let me, so, let, let me do this follow-up though, Rod, and that is, um, sure. we are gonna obviously give everybody a chance to weigh in on this, but, but the, the issue you described or the scenario you described is 15 law enforcement officers bursting into your home, throwing a distraction device in there, and potentially accidentally shooting one of your kids. Now, right. th does that happen in Canada? Well, it happens, well, have, has the, have the police ever improperly shot anyone in Canada? I guess that's the question I would throw at you. Well, yeah, the, I mean, we know the answer to that. We have empirically provable facts to say the answer to that is yes. But the scenario you described, which is, you'll admit, a fairly provocative scenario, does that happen in Canada? Well, it is a provocative scenario. And I, and, and I said from the outset, obviously you didn't see all of that. Um, the context is, so I'm saying here's a potential scenario when you, when you tell 2.2 million people that you have to take their things away because of the actions of just a handful of people. You get non-compliance, non-compliance is bad. I'm trying to stop the scenario where people are, un, are, are burdened with unjust laws and thus would be in a position where they may not comply because that's bad for law and order. Now, this is a scenario that I was trying to convey to doctors who don't know anything about these things. Now, is it strong? Absolutely, but I want them to think, and I've invited them to sit down uh, with us and just talk about all of the, they only have about 25% of the whole story. I want them to have all of it. Okay, but let's get some- Every time we try to establish a conversation with them, we, are, we just get abuse in return. So Let, let's get I, some feedback. Yeah. Let's get some feedback to uh, to you. Now, Camille, obviously you've run some pretty strong uh, campaigns in the past that are designed to provoke and to get a message out that, that your followers would approve of. Isn't that what Rod's doing here? Oh, I think there's a huge difference between the campaigns I've run and a lot of other organizations run, which are truthful and actually seek to enhance a truth-seeking function in society and present people with accurate information that they can present uh, and then make their decisions on the uh, undercover investigations are a great example of that. But you know, I've worked with police too over the decades. I used to be a criminal defense lawyer before my days in animal rights and have seen lots of information about how police take down large drug busts and do early morning raids. I can tell you they don't use distraction devices. The scenario is concocted uh, by Rod to provoke an emotional reaction. It's not designed to present accurate facts. And I don't think 
that it's designed to present accurate information. It's just designed to provoke an emotional response in people, which I think is the effect it's having. Steve, what's your view on it? Uh, well, I would agree with, with Camille. I, it's 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 way over the top, and uh, it is. And I worry that you know we're all rational people. Rod, you seem like a smart guy, but I mean, we don't know who's watching this. What kind of people are 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 taking this in and are now become you know somewhat paranoid about the police and what's going to happen and people coming and seizing their guns? Uh, I, I find it alarming. And look, Dr. Ahmed, you, you mean you say she's trying to take all their guns away? Uh, we just saw a clip of her where the legislation was put up there. You put the provisions of the new gun control legislation. Pretty moderate to me when I was looking at the provisions there. There was a long way from a, from a ban, and, and she was saying it's a good step forward. I did not hear a wide-eyed radical there saying that they're going to take uh, your guns away. I, I don't think that's the case at all. And again, you're not really presenting it fairly. I, th I think Rod's view is, uh, well, I should let him make it, but my understanding, Rod, was that your view was this may be, C-71 may be the thin edge of the wedge. Today they're trying to regulate, tomorrow they may try to confiscate your weapon, your uh, handguns altogether. Is that, have I got that sort of right? If, if you take a second to go to the Doctors for Protection from Guns website, you'll see they're advocating for C-71, they're advocating on a total ban on handguns, and a total ban on so-called assault weapons, whatever they deem those to be. So they, they basically want all guns gone. So now it's this is interesting. So people are taking, you know, the, the panel are taking pause and they're going, well, hold on, is that a real scenario? And yeah, it is over the top, but it was designed to do exactly what it's doing. Let's think these things through. I mean, that scenario is possible. So let's think these things through ahead of time before we advocate for things that, that we don't really understand fully. That's all we're trying to say. Josh, is that video that we just showed of Rod, is that fair game in an effort to provoke or too much? Well, I, I actually, I think about it, I think about what the goal he's trying to achieve with the video. Rod, I, and I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on this, not to, not to interject too much. The, Knock yourself out, But generally when I think of advocacy campaigns, uh, I, the activities fall into a couple different categories. There's recruiting your members, there's correcting the facts when, when debate's gone off the rails, uh, and there's advocating a position with decision makers. Uh, you usually put your efforts <laughs> where you think you're gonna get a return, and in this case, there's, I think if you feel that the facts need to be corrected, I can understand why you'd be moving ahead with that kind of a measure, but um, I don't know that you'd be convincing any of the people who, uh, who are the subject of that discussion uh, to join your cause through that, that kind of a communication. I, I'm, I'm not sure that it's, speaking as somebody who's helped to support an advocacy campaigns, I'm not convinced that it's the best use of resources. Rod, you wanna come back on that? Well, absolutely. So that, that video was a desperate attempt to get attention from the doctors because the rhetoric that they were espousing was heading in that direction. So yeah, it was, it was a very strong message. Uh, concerning correcting the record, the first video you showed was a video we have coming out tomorrow, which is a, a mini documentary on the uh, chronology of, of our interaction with the doctor. So uh, while, while it was probably one of the most inflammatory things I've ever put on the internet, uh, it's not representative of 98% of what we do. You did say, um, Rod, earlier in the program, and let me just do a quick follow-up on that right here. You said mainstream media doesn't work for organizations like mine, in other words, like yours. Um, how so? Well, a couple of comments. I jumped at the opportunity to be on your show because I, I know your show and I know that you're fair. And your show is an exception to the rule. Um, the other media that we've dealt with, so I'll throw out the Globe and Mail as probably the most egregious example, um, is borderline tabloid journalism where they pick winners and losers long before they ever make a phone call. And it's been near impossible to get a fair shake uh, for gun owners in Canada. If you're, if you're supporting gun control, you'll got, you get the world as, as your audience. If you're against gun control, then uh, you get treated the way that gun owners have been treated by most of the media, with yours as an exception. Okay, well, let me ask Camille about whether she feels the same way. Camille, uh, not too long ago, you were on this program. Uh, you were on a couple of times, actually, uh, in, in very short order, but I want to talk about the first time you were on. Um, a lot of people in the agricultural industry got very upset with some of the things you had to say, and you found yourself in the eye of a hurricane. Uh, is that right? Is it the eye of the hurricane, or is it the eye of a tornado? I keep forgetting hurricane, on these things. Hurricane. Anyway, you're in the mid... I have a Twitter store, and that's even better. Good. How did you react to being uh, at the center of all of that? Well, I, uh, you know, it was interesting. I came on and spoke about the fact that animal agriculture in this country is not regulated, so there's no welfare laws at the federal or provincial level that apply to animals used on farms, and that's appalling to people, and they're surprised when they learn that. 
And uh, farmers weren't happy with that information getting out there, so that provoked a bit of a Twitter storm, and I was constantly under attack for about a week or so. And, um, you know, I think when that happens, as an advocate, you have to use that as an opportunity to advance your position. So for me, it was really good to see people engaging with this idea that we don't have regulations protecting animals on farms, because that message wasn't previously out there, and now it is. So I welcome those opportunities, and I think as an advocate, you have to seize on them to be at your most effective. And in fact, there was so much... Um well, there was so much feedback to your first appearance. We had you on a week later to talk about some of the uh, comments that had come up during that. Antonio, I want to get your... Help us understand why it seems to be nowadays it's all about the Internet. It's all about these intense campaigns on the Internet. How it, is, it is. It uh, is. Certainly. Um, I think, first of all, the provocation of um, emotional responses is the business of advocacy. If they don't do that, they miss out on a great opportunity to... Uh, win over uh, people who take them seriously and listen to them. But in so doing, one of the things that happens is that they uh, negate the expertise of people who should be taken seriously. Public health experts, trauma surgeons, law enforcement, um, farmers who, are, who constitute a community of practice who know about how to raise their livestock and how to care for them, such that uh, there is a more complex reality than, than is typically presented in this kind of messaging. And it's a kind of messaging that succeeds through digital networks. Digital networks, more and more, are the, are the mechanisms through which people participate in the fabric of their societies. And as a result of this, what we end up creating for ourselves are silos where we isolate one another uh, from, uh, from, um, from our other uh, uh, citizens in, in our communities, in our, in our towns and, and cities. Not constructive, I gather. Not too much. Not too much. Uh, the, the, the sound, uh, the uh, resonating chambers that we talk about. Right. Echo chambers. Echo chambers. Right. Rod, uh, I've often heard your group compared to the National Rifle Association in the United States. How do you like that comparison? Well, of course, it uses a pejorative to, uh, to as I said in the, in the other video, was just to, just to insult and dismiss us. Um, the, the NRA in the United States is a completely different organization than anything that could ever exist in Canada. The regulatory system is completely different. The cultural um, uh, environment is completely different. There is really no comparison. As I said, it's just a go-to. It's like, well, you know what, you're NRA. And, uh, and it's, not, it doesn't, it's not helping forward the discussion that needs to happen about gun control in Canada. Well, let's nail this down one way or another. Do you get funding from the NRA? Of course we don't. <laughs> you know, I got senators asking me that stuff. Of course we don't. And uh, the NRA, as an organization, they, it's illegal for them to, put, uh, to take any of their money and move it out of the country based on their own uh, articles of incorporation. So we are, we're a grassroots, 100% grassroots um, organization. Even the businesses that we get $100 a year from are small businesses. So we don't get any uh, gun manufacturing funding. Uh, the other slur that gets thrown at us is uh, if the gun industry. Well, it's not, yeah, it's not gun manufacturers that fund us. It's individual gun owners saying, I need somebody to go out there and fight my battle for me. We're obviously very interested um, in general, and on this program in particular right now, and Camille, I'll put this to you, on the influence that, um, that traditionally more aggressive American-style tactics have had down there, and whether that kind of style of campaign has now come to Canada. Uh, the hidden camera thing very much started in the States, and now, Camille, as we saw, has moved up here. What's your overarching view about bringing those sort of more aggressive American-style tactics to Canada? Well, I think as the uh, smaller country on the North American continent and obviously the influence of the uh, U.S. media, we've seen the same sort of influence creep into Canada as we have with the media and advocacy strategies. And so uh, it's, a, it's a reflection and a function of the fact that there's more money in the States, organizations tend to be better funded, they pioneer things, and if they're effective, they can easily creep across the border via the Internet. So I think undercover investigations in the States are a great example of that because they've been highly effective and Canadians have seen how effective they are. In fact, they've been so effective in the States that legislators have actually started passing laws to ban them, to criminalize anybody who goes into facilities and gets those, uh, those shots and gets that footage. So 
Um, I, you know, I think it's, it's smart in the sense that Canadians are looking to what has worked in other jurisdictions, uh, not just America, but around the world, and incorporating those policies. I would say that we have a, a long tradition of using um, our own strategies in Canada as well to gather footage. Uh, we talked about the seal hunt a little bit earlier. But uh, that was a situation where the very first footage coming out from the seal hunt uh, in Canada in the 1960s prompted a lot of change, and that was happening here before anywhere else. Josh, your view of the sort of American-style campaign coming here? Yeah, I, I think I draw a little bit of a distinction between uh, the tactics and tools and the behavior. And I'll, I'll build a little bit on a point that Camille was just making. The U.S. is an enormous market, uh, and the opportunities for advocacy campaigns to be sophisticated uh, and to try new things are just, they're so much greater. Um, so, of course, there are advocacy organizations that are based here in Canada who are seeing opportunities to import tactics that have never been used. But the, the distinction that I draw is, is on the behavior side. There's, there's no borders that contain bad behavior. There, there's no one country that has monopoly on that. So the far end of the spectrum, the very aggressive tactics, that's not unique to any one jurisdiction. And I'm not, I'm not sure that we're taking a specific influence from the U.S. on that. I mean, I think, I think back to the late 90s and Weibo Ludwig, who was yep. uh, convicted of uh, having a role in destroying an oil well in Alberta. Like, Eco-terrorism, eco -terrorism, and very much served a sentence. The bad behavior exists independent of the jurisdiction. I hear you. Um, Steve, I think where you were going earlier, though, was that there was some fake news put out uh, on some phony website in the United States during the last American election campaign to the effect that Hillary Clinton was running a child prostitution ring out of the basement of a pizza parlor Pizzagate. in Washington, yeah. and somebody saw that, took a shotgun down there, and wanted to do some damage to the people who were doing it. Now, it was obviously fake, but is your concern that that kind of thing, given the provocative nature of what we've been talking about, may be coming to a, a neighborhood near you? Well, a absolutely. I mean, this is, this is what we're all concerned about, and this is what I meant about these unintended consequences. You put this stuff out there, you, you, you put very provocative things, they're going to come and knock down your door and, and, and harm your children, and how is that going to impact people that, that, are, that are watching it? The, and, and I think you can't, you can't predict that, and that's a very good example of the, of the pizza, pizza gate. Another aspect, you know, I'm, I'm quite Im impressed here by Camille's reaction to the Twitter storm that she was in, very, very thick skin, and some of us that are involved in public policy work, you have to be that, but that's not what's happening out there on the internet. It's, you know, we tend to approach it as using the internet to exchange press releases and statements and still use evidence, but it's a cage fight out there. It's a cage fight. Yeah. And not only are they attacking you on, on, on on Facebook, they go to your family, they go to your friends, they go to your boss, they try to get you fired. And it's, I hate to admit it, but it's effective. I've spoken, for instance, to reporters with their fingers on the keys, writing stories, and they know that there will be an internet campaign to try to get them fired from their job, depending on what they write. Reporters don't want to admit it, but it's, it's that kind of campaign is effective in, in the back of the mind and it has an impact. i got a minute left here. Josh, uh, I should ask you from your political experience whether these kinds of campaigns actually work. Um, advocacy campaigns yeah. in general? Absolutely. Oh, no question. And I'm, I know uh, I took the liberty of taking a uh, look to see if uh, w what Rod's activities were outside of the, the examples we saw on the screen here today. I know there's been a lot of lobbying at the federal level to push for the organization's advocacy goals. We'll see how that works out in the wash. Obviously, there's an election campaign coming up. We'll have to, and there's a bill before the Senate right now, which is still being reviewed. But absolutely, it works. I mean, go governments who are looking to make policy change they're required to consult. They actually seek out those kinds of opinions. And organizations that are trying to put something on people's radars and are trying to make sure that decision makers pay attention to them, they, I've seen a number of campaigns be very effective at actually changing public policy, for sure. Gotcha. Yeah. I want to thank all of you for coming on to TVO tonight and sharing your views with us. Rod Giltaka from the Canadian Coalition for Firearm Rights. Thank you for being there for us in Vancouver, British Columbia via Skype. Camille Labchuk from Animal Justice, she was there in the nation's capital for us. And then here in our studio, Steve Staples from Public Response, Joshua Zanin from Proof, Antonio Sorge from York University. Great to have you all on the agenda tonight. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Great to be here. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.